Welcome everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Here we are gathered together for Shabbat just now one week before we will celebrate Passover, which comes in on Saturday night of next week. And I want to speak a little bit about Passover as we begin to prepare our hearts for this extraordinary experience. As we gather around the tables next weekend, we really will have one objective. And that objective is to tell a story. The story that we share on the nights of Seder our, is really our, it's our meta narrative. It's not just a story, it's the story. A story so foundational, so critical that it has sustained our people for thousands of years through trial and tragedy and also through triumph. This is the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim, the story of how our people suffered for hundreds of years of brutality, affliction, and abuse, and then walked triumphantly from enslavement to liberation, from darkness to light, from degradation to dignity, from narrowness to expansiveness, from paralysis to possibility. All of that is captured in the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim, the story of the Exodus from Egypt. And this story is so central to Jewish memory and liturgy and ritual and experience. And it's not only precious to us, to the Jewish community, it's actually become ubiquitous. It's inspired people across time and space who yearn for freedom. We talk a lot about Michael Walter, the religious philosopher, who's taught us that, that one can find the Exodus almost everywhere, wherever people know the Bible, and experience oppression. The exodus from Egypt has sustained their spirits and inspired their resistance, he says. And I think that perhaps it's precisely because of the eternality of the story that we look to every single detail of it, every word of the narrative, in order to try to uncover deep truths and enduring messages for our time. That's why we go so deeply into this story during the holiday of Passover and why we constantly revisit this story month after month, week after week, day after day in our tradition. So it's in that spirit of looking into every detail to fully understand the richness of this story and what it has to teach us that I want to invite us this morning to take a look at one particular piece of this narrative, one of the turning point moments in our ancestors' journey toward liberation. In the book of Exodus chapter two, verses 23 to 25, we are told that after a long time passed, the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel were groaning under the bondage and they cried out for help from God. And that cry somehow reached God and God then remembered the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that becomes the beginning of our story of redemption. I've spent a good deal of time with these verses, trying to understand the nature of the Israelites' cry. What happened after hundreds of years of suffering and oppression that finally made the people cry out at that point? What made it so that in that moment, God could hear their cry and felt compelled to act in history toward their redemption? In order to answer this question, the rabbis key into one detail that comes from the very beginning of our verse. It says, Vayamot Melech Mitzrayim, a long time after that, the king of Egypt died. They argue that that is critical to understanding the Israelites' tears in that moment. And Ramban Nachmanides explains that our ancestors, like anyone living under a tyrant, put all of their hope on the end of that tyrant's reign they knew that one day he would either die or he would be pushed out of power and then they would finally be free. So why are they crying when he dies? Because when he finally dies, their problems were not solved immediately. And that made them weep and that made them wail. I can relate. I know what it means to live under a terrible regime one that violates your every sense of right and wrong, truth and lie, decency and cruelty. I know what it's like to look for strength in the knowledge that this cannot last forever. 
the awareness that whenever the tyrant finally leaves, we will finally emerge from the terror that he has inflicted on our people, on our democracy. A few years ago, in a particularly dark moment for our country, my very wise father-in-law wrote a letter to his children and his grandchildren saying as much. This moment is painful, he said, but I've lived a long time. I've seen many hard chapters in this country, and I promise you that we will emerge from this. And I too have taken refuge in the idea of the long arc of the moral universe, which ultimately bends toward justice. And I understand how particularly horrifying it is when one finally begins to emerge from the horror only to realize that the pain has not instantaneously disappeared, that the problems persist, that the suffering has not ceased. According to Ramban, the Israelites cried tears of despair when they got to the point that they realized they would choose death over life under that kind of oppression. And it's in those tears that God is ultimately activated to act on the people's behalf. The problem with Ramban's teaching though, is that this is no moral message. No preacher can get up on Shabbat morning and say, when things are bad, just wait until they get a lot worse. So much worse that there's literally no hope and then cry out to God and only then will God hear you. Ramban's interpretation is hardly an inspiring sermon. So instead, I want to offer you this morning a reading that comes from the Mea Shiloach, the Ishbitzer Rebbe, who wrote in Poland in the 1800s. He asks the same question, what was the cry that elicited God's compassion? And his answer is that it was not a cry of despair. It was a cry of wakefulness. Ki adkan lo hayabehem shum hitorarut lizok ulihit palel. Until this moment, he says, they were not awake enough to scream and to pray. Their pain had been there all along for hundreds of years, generation after generation, the Israelites suffered under the weight of Egyptian oppression. They saw their elders beaten and their babies slaughtered, their backs broken with hard labor. But for all that heartache, they did not cry out until he to Rebahem Za'aka, the scream was awakened in them. The scream was awakened in them. For the Ishbitzer, the cry of our enslaved ancestors was not a cry of despair. It was a cry of wakefulness, a cry of recognition that things ought not be, things must not be as they have been. This is the beginning of redemption, he says, when a person is roused to scream to God. What does it take for the scream to be awakened in us. I know many white people in America who describe the murder of George Floyd as an awakening. Even some black activists have written and spoken about their own awakening during this time to the systemic nature of the threat against their own lives. I've spoken many times about the nature of my own growing awareness around the systemic nature of racial injustice and the need not only for reform, but for a radical rethinking, for a reimagining. Similarly, for many Jews, I've heard Charlottesville, where Nazis and white nationalists chanted, Jews will not replace us. They've described that as a wake up call. And for those who hit snooze, on Charlottesville and tried to doze back off. It wasn't long before the shooting at Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh and the Chabad in Poway, an abrupt ending to the fantasy of the American golden age for Jews, a call to awareness of our vulnerability in the United States and around the world. Well, this week, our country has had another wake up call. We've been warned for the past year about the rise in violent anti-Asian hate crimes whether they're classified as hate crimes by the authorities or not. We know that in the past year alone, there have been 3,800 reported incidents of violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders or AAPIs. We also know that there's a long and tortured history of racist violence in this country, not only specifically targeting black Americans and native Americans, but also targeting all people of color, including AAPIs a history that goes back long before the Civil War. There was the Chinese Exclusion Act and Japanese internment. There was violence spurred by angry white mobs like the massacre of Chinese Angelinos in 
in the late 1800s, attacks on Vietnamese workers by the KKK 100 years later in the 1980s. And there was also aggression sparked by government officials, like the imposed restrictions during the bubonic plague in 1900 in San Francisco. We might have learned all of this in school. We might know all of this history, but perhaps we didn't know it in our hearts. It lived in our brains, not in our hearts until this week when we were awakened by an act of domestic terror targeting Asian women in Atlanta. Many, even in the AAPI community, are describing this moment as an awakening. It's not that it's new, but the overt racism and the immediate willingness of many people to excuse or minimize the horror of the attacks, that has compelled many people to speak out loud what has previously been said only in a whisper, that this country is profoundly unwell, that we are profoundly unwell, that it's not safe here for many people, including AAPIs, and especially Asian American and Pacific Islander women. Horrible videos from the past year of elderly Asian men being thrown down to the concrete while they're out for a walk in the morning. These are not anomalous, but these are part of a long history of unaddressed abuse and bigotry and cruelty in America. The myth, the myth of the model minority, which has made it even harder for people to understand the vulnerability experienced by what is a broad and diverse community that is again and again targeted by hate. This population was already vulnerable when last year, the most powerful man in the world used his bully pulpit, not only to reinforce racist stereotypes, but to racialize the pandemic, to take our suffering, our fear, our anguish, and direct it toward an easy scapegoat, a community already seen by many as perpetual outsiders. Or as Eric Nam, a Korean American singer and songwriter from Atlanta wrote this week, a community already excluded, interned, vilified, emasculated, fetishized, and murdered. Nam describes his own growing realization that his community must not submit to the normalization of racism against them. He writes, to grow up believing that we need to be okay with racism in order to have a seat at the table is not okay. To internalize racism at such a young age in retrospect warped his, my sense, he writes, of normality. This is how confusing and convoluted it can be growing up as an Asian American or Pacific Islander. And I know that this writer is not alone. The events of this week have led to an extraordinary outpouring of grief and horror, solidarity and love. There's a different cry being heard this week, a cry not of despair, but a cry of wakefulness, of unwillingness to let the past go without a reckoning, without some truth telling and without real change. I wanna share with you that in a strange but meaningful coincidence, I realized this week that eight years ago when we came to Parshat Vayikra, the Parsha that we read today which Tyler Hogan's going to share with us in just a few moments. Eight years ago, when we read this, I gave a sermon on gun violence. That week, a six-month-old child had been shot five times on the south side of Chicago as her father changed her diaper. And I noted that at the beginning of our Parsha, God calls out with a booming voice. It's as clear as day, but for reasons we don't fully understand, only Moses can hear that voice. And I said that day, that one day something would finally turn the tide of history and wake up our nation so that we could finally end the curse of gun violence and hatred in this country. Five years later, I stood before our community on Parshat Vayikra, which we read this morning, and I gave a sermon in the aftermath of the Parkland massacre at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. We were grieving. And we looked at the Torah's instruction from the beginning of the book of Leviticus regarding what to do in a case in which the whole community of Israel has erred without even realizing it and they're guilty. And we had hard conversations about how gun violence and racism and misogyny only can persist in a society through the complicity of the people who live in that society. As Abraham Joshua Heschel famously wrote in 1963, an honest estimation of the moral state of our society will disclose that some are guilty 
but all are responsible. Would Parkland be the tragedy to wake us up to that reality? Would the murder of our children not prove to us once and for all that silence in the face of evil renders us complicit to that evil? The very next year on Parshat Vaikra, which we will read this morning in a few moments, we grieve together as a community following the terror attacks targeting Muslims in New Zealand. 49 people were murdered while they prayed. We lifted our voices in solidarity with the victims and their families, friends and loved ones, and the millions of Muslims around the world with anguished hearts. And now here we are again, just two years after that, reading Parshat Vayikra after another mass shooting, another terror attack fueled by the intersection of white supremacy, misogyny, and easy access to weapons of war. I don't really believe in magic. I don't believe that this time as we prepare to read the beginning of the book of Leviticus and prepare for Passover is a particularly auspicious time for horrific acts of violence, but the coincidence of this timing does put a fine point on it. We know well that these moments can pass without any meaningful change. We know that we can and often do leave the survivors and victims' families to hold their grief in isolation, to bang their heads against the brick wall of Congress where gerrymandering and flawed Senate rules have rendered it essentially impossible to affect meaningful change. But maybe now, maybe now finally the scream will be awakened in us. Maybe now we will rise up together and demand the reckoning that we so desperately need for the sake of all of our lives. The people in this country are waking up. White supremacy and racist violence, gender-based violence, gun violence, these crises have long plagued our nation. And I will let the historians unpack the confluence event of events that made these years, 2020 and 2021, a crucible, a turning point in our nation's history. For now, I beg us not to suppress the scream that has been awakened in us. This cry, the cry of anger and anguish. This is not a despairing cry. It is a hopeful cry, a wakeful cry, a loving cry. May it be the cry that stands at the beginning of our collective redemption. Shabbat Shalom.